You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. The blowout of the Deepwater Horizon well off the Louisiana coast in 2010 is still being felt to this day. It claimed 11 lives, and the resulting oil spill damaged fishing and tourism, as well as marine and wildlife habitats. It also forced the company to sign a multi-billion dollar compensation deal. As well as costing the firm $42 billion, that's £26 billion, BP was hit by the ban on new US government work last November because of how it handled the disaster. However, a U.S. federal court's intervention in the BP oil spill claim settlement has brought payments for business losses to a halt. After paying businesses more than $1.3 billion between April and September, a U.S. court asked for any further payments not traceable to the spill to be blocked. BP blames Patrick Juno. He's a Louisiana-based court-appointed administrator whom it accuses of compensating fictitious and inflated losses. But what constitutes adequate punishment for BP? Has the balance been made over its admission of culpability and financial reparation? How does BP in particular and the oil industry in general move on? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined on the line by Nat Krasnov. He's a co-owner of the Harahan-based business Digital Designers, which had its claim approved in July, but it hasn't been paid yet. Also joining me in the studio in London is Paul Stock. He's an independent oil consultant and solicitor. Richard North, who's a media fellow of the free market think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, and Malcolm Graham Woods, who is an oil and gas consultant. A warm welcome to you, uh, gentlemen. First of all, I'll, I'll go to you, Nat. Can you tell me about your claim? We do business along the entire Gulf Coast in, in our company without going into details, very strongly into the hospitality industry, into the hotels, into the port facilities and so forth, and commercial businesses. And it's been a long three and a half years, Brendan. Our claim went through the process. We were awarded approximately one-third of our losses. And, and the reason for that, by the way, is that our office location where we actually do no work it's strictly our office. Because of our location, we were limited to a certain percentage of monies, which is actually about one-third of what we actually proved that we lost. BP appealed our claim. We won the appeal, and then BP actually had the opportunity to appeal to a higher level directly to the judge. And once they read our answers to, uh, on their first appeal, they agreed that we should be paid. And in July... They signed the uh, the papers were signed. We signed the papers also uh, to agree to be paid, and we were not paid to this day. It, well, what it, kind of impact has that had on your business? In our case, we happen to be uh, the real exception because, unlike some of the claims that were recently approved and not paid because of the decision uh, in the recent court decision holding up payments, we were actually approved before this even went to the courts. So, in our particular case, it caused us to lay off about. 60% of our employees caused us to lay off our, su our main supervisors as we were a growing company at the time. And the last three years, you know, we actually made a decision. We were advised to file bankruptcy by our attorneys, but we chose not to do so because we did not want to hurt our vendors. We did not want to hurt our customers. We fought the battle for three years. We're back to being a profitable company, but we were set back three years plus the fact that we're never going to recover the amount of money that we know we lost. So who do you blame here? I mean, clearly you're unhappy with BP, but the, the judicial process is, is as much to blame in that here we have, I guess, the settlements administrator effectively halting the payouts. And there have been considerable payouts, and there were considerable payouts right from, from the end of 2010, weren't there? Oh, there were. And obviously our, our, our animosity was towards BP until they agreed to pay us in July, and at that point, we expected to receive a check within two to three weeks. And our, our blame at that point shifted to the settlement group because we still don't know why, we weren't, why they didn't go ahead and pay us once BP agreed to pay us. But now, in the last few weeks, because of BP taking us to the federal courts, to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal, and the more recent decision to delay payments, we're back to blaming BP because they had they not gone to the courts in the last three or four weeks. You know, we, we wouldn't have the delay right now. Paul, after the spill, the company's leaders seem to go to the White House. They seem to get a, 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 some well-earned humiliation, some might say, a real dressing down. But they also made an unusual gesture. They did say to President Obama they'd set aside $20 billion in money for cleanup and compensation. Why do you think they did this off the bat without actually being forced to? Technically, their statutory legal position in the U.S., 
was that they could have hidden behind a $75 million cap on liability for offshore drillers. BP did not do that, and basically, if they had elected to do that, their businesses would have been finished in the US. The Gulf of Mexico is one of probably three areas that BP is concentrating on, and if they'd fallen foul of of the White House by hiding behind that liability cap, they would never have done serious business in the US again. But, I mean, that $75 million liability limit, Richard, uh, that's, that's imposed by the Federal Oil Pollution Act. They almost paid nearly $400 million in the spring of 2010, so clearly they felt guilty, but they also, this was a commercial decision, a strategic decision as much as anything, do you think? I suppose these things are muddled up, aren't they? They're doing, the, doing the right thing and then being seen to do the right thing is uh, works on all, all kinds of levels. I mean, Nat here sounds to me as though he's much more a victim of, of the legal game that gets played than he is of any goodwill or badwill on the part of <coughs> BP. One set of judges allow, let's call it pejoratively, a rather lax view of compensation, and then somebody else comes along and tightens it up. And Muggins, in this case, p- poor Nat, as, as, as we're bound to think it, falls in the gap between and one wishes in a way that the first the first sort of approach hadn't been too uh, punishing of BP, too generous to the, com- to the compensation idea, and that the second one had been maybe a little more disciplined as it tightened up the rules. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. We're discussing the fate of BP after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill with Nat Krasnov, Paul Stock, Richard North and Malcolm Graham Woods. Malcolm Graham Woods... How damaging was this disaster for BP and is it still being felt to this day? Uh, Well, it's still being felt. There's no doubt about that. It was extremely damaging to BP at the time. It lost uh, tens of billions of market cap. So the company isn't anything like as large as it was. I mean, the problem was that at the time uh, they were in deep trouble and they gave away almost everything immediately. So they signed up to things they never thought would be so much. So, I mean, the, their calculations that it's cost them $42 billion in fines and fees and so on so far, I reckon that's $10 billion light already. And then, of course, uh, we've still got the main uh, litigation going through at the moment under the Clean Water Act, which could cost them another 18 or $20 billion. You know, the, the, the trouble is they're fighting on so many different fronts. They're fighting uh, going to the next stage, the third stage on clean water, uh, which comes next and could be a huge fine. They're fighting against the businesses which they claim aren't involved at all and are still trying to claim money off them. And, of course, they're still appealing the original phase one and phase two. In terms of the market, the stock market, the valuation and so on, um, BP's become was a super major up with BP, with Chevron and Shell and Exxon and so on, and they're no longer that. They've had to sell off assets, uh, as I say, to to pay the forty two billion that they've already accounted for. So they're a smaller company. They lost fifty or sixty billion pounds of market cap so in the weeks after Macondo. Uh, and they're, I describe it as being that the company is spending more time on litigation than trying to find oil and gas. What I'm foxed by is always to, to well, in this specific, specific case, it's so complicated with BB because you don't know whether the shareholder hit happened mostly because of the spill <coughs> or mostly because of its troubles in Russia or, or in what mixture. It was pretty obvious from April 2010 onwards how much damage that Macondo had caused. Mm. Uh, there were side issues, TNK, BP, the issues with that, trying to get out of the, of the problems, the, you know, the real problem they had there. But whilst that was going, they still most of the time had the big dividends from TNK before the, the, the deal with Rosneft. So... I think it's it's pretty pretty clear. I think you can probably say that this has cost BP de minimis a hundred billion dollars, probably quite a lot more. Paul Stock, um, I'd like to get your view on this. Um, Bob Dudley, the CEO, said that uh, Juno, the litigator that we were talking about, um, had hijacked the settlement, and there was fictitious there were fictitious losses being paid out. What do you make of that? Does, do you think BP had, had, had acted too quickly and then were, they were kind of tied to this reparation game, which, um, which seems, to be, um, seems to have been exploited somewhat? US attorneys, to the extent they're against BP, are suggesting that BP is suffering a syndrome known as uh, set laws of regret. I don't think that's the case at all. I think that the real big case in this class settlement action, and the most interesting thing about this is it's probably the biggest and most complicated class settlement arrangement that 
has ever been seen in the US. Basically, BP faced a tsunami of claims, and apparently even recently they're receiving 10,000 claims a month. So they had to find some mechanism to process a large number of claims efficiently. Normally, in, in a legal matter, if you're claiming damages, you have to relate the damages or the, the injury or loss you've suffered to an actual event. You end up lawyer, with lawyers arguing about remoteness. In this case, BP, in, in a court-sanctioned sanctioned settlement, agreed to jump that process, and basically the idea of direct loss causation was dropped, and BP's settlement mechanism was such that if in a if you're operating in a defined area in a defined period of time, if you could document or evidence a defined loss, the settlement would, would pay out that defined loss. Uh, I can assure you of everybody speaking right now, I have followed this as closely, I have been as a part of this as closely through the couple of settlement groups, I've followed the legal process closely, and I can tell you that very much a part of this conversation, I'd like to say, disturbs me. And everybody's saying exactly what they believe is true. But there's, there's another factor here, Brendan. We, in this conversation, I've heard $100 billion. I've heard $50 billion. On my own, I've heard 40 and $50 billion. And I would like to point out that the innocence of BP, as, of what they've done in the last month or so, is very hypocritical. You don't have a claim, you don't have a class action like this without some people understanding they're going to be paid that shouldn't be, and some people like ourselves that are going to get underpaid. But when you talk about $50 billion and $100 billion, and I'm watching BP go to court to, do, to use every tactic they could possibly use in the last couple of months to, to slow down payments, and we're talking about a difference of them complaining about whether or not it's going to cost them $7 billion in payouts or $9 billion in payouts, or $11 billion. That's a far away from $50 billion and $100 billion. So I can assure you that the innocence of BP has gone right out the window in the last 30 or 40 days because now all they're doing is stalling. So once the discussion turns to what the stock is worth, how the stockholders are protected, and so forth, all of a sudden we're getting away from the fact, and the fact is a company like Mon has suffered for three and a half years, long beyond the amount of loss that we took, but the three years that we lost during that period of time to grow as a company. So I, I just wanted to make that point of the difference in the discussion between 50 and $100 billion and a 3 or $4 billion that BP is going to compete against right now to put a stop to our payments. Paul Stock, what's your reaction to that? Nat, um, uh, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm not debating this with you. I'm interested sure. in your situation. I, and I'll just make one comment first. I think when we all read in the, the business press here in the UK, at the moment, we're told that um, it's going to cost BP about 42 billion. I think when Malcolm was talking about 100 million, he was really saying that this Gulf oil spill has badly damaged BP. And in terms of, you know, reputation, it's probably costing $50 billion. So just kind of the business press, they're saying, you know, it's cost $42 billion. And that breaks down into various things. But there was this $20 billion fund which was set up. And uh, the claims process in, in, in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, your area, seems, as you say, to be between $7 billion and $11 billion. There's been a 4 or $5 billion criminal settlement and there's a there's a statutory settlement under the Clean Water Act, which could be from zero to 21 billion, and there's a civil claim in relation to to uh, responsibility as between the people drilling the well, as between themselves. So, for sure, this has cost a lot of money. I think for sure this is the biggest thing any of us have seen. Uh, you know, it, it's an international oil company had a blowout, five billion barrels of oil were lost in the lost in the sea and washed up on the beach. So none of us you know, would minimise just what a shocking thing this is. And uh, also, this class action is, is the biggest ever seen in America, apparently, or, or one of the more complex. The idea was that you define an area, which is Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, some of Florida, some of Texas, and within that area, you could go into the mechanism. If you were able to demonstrate loss, you'd get paid out. The big debate has become, um, OK, you know, we didn't look for causation, we didn't look for a direct link to the oil spill, we just said if you've lost money subject to certain parameters in a certain area, you'll pay, we'll pay you. The biggest 
point now is BP and their lawyers are saying that there's manipulation and there's dysfunctionality in the way the settlement's operating because construction businesses 200 miles away are claiming $9.7 million, whatever. So th there's been a bit of a debate about, you know, are the genuine claimants or not? And I'd be very interested to know, um, are you in the sort of main area or are you, are you out of that area that, that I spoke of, the geographic area in the settlement? I'll answer that in two ways. First, uh, our office is located 90 miles from the Gulf, but all of our business, and, and in the settlement, Paul, it was divided into payout zones. Yeah. If we were literally five miles away from where we're located right now, we would be receiving triple the amount that we've been awarded. But because of our office, which is nothing but a clerical office, because of our office and not because of where we do our business along the entire Gulf Coast, <clears throat> we are limited to a, a, a bonus amount of one-fourth of a percent. Yeah. Uh, of one, excuse me, one-fourth above the actual losses that we demonstrated. Yeah. So that's the first part. The second part is, again, and this is so important, you know, nobody put a gun to BP's head and said that they had to sign this agreement. And everybody knew, including BP, and by the way, if you read what was said in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals last week, there was a lady judge when BP themselves said we agreed to certain things. She even she said, "Well, you didn't know what you were doing, so I'm going to overturn this." Um, uh, again, we are a prime example of a company that is going to receive one third of what we documented that we lost in business. So for BP to go to court and complain that some people are being paid they shouldn't be paid, and by the way, I personally know of a couple of companies that are getting paid that shouldn't receive a penny. The particular case that Paul was referring to there was in Alabama, a, a construction company in northern Alabama, which was given $9.7 million, even though it does no work near the Gulf of Mexico. So clearly these cases are undermining your reparation claims as much as anything. I understand that. But again, now we get back to the numbers. We're talking about the difference of two, three, four million dollars tops. And I can guarantee you I know plenty of companies just like ours that are receiving way under the amount of their actual losses. Uh, so that's part of what was accepted by BP. They knew going in that some people are going to get paid that don't deserve to be, but they also never bothered to take the time to tell the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal that companies like my company are being underpaid. Is it fair to say or to wonder whether BP, as it were, were way too generous and open-handed at first, rather late in the day they get crabby and you get caught by that, I hope you'll accept that, that I, I, I'm not discounting for a second your case and, and its merits. But BP have been, I won't say generous because it was a calculation as well, but they were relatively open-handed for rather a long time and it has cost them a huge amount of money probably some of it wasted on cases not altogether deserving. And now they're being crabby. Isn't it often the way that the deserving get crunched then? Well, I'll answer that question also by telling you that you may not be aware, but I can assure you that the majority of cases, and, and I know you're not aware of this, uh, and I am, mm. uh, because of the law firm that's representing us, and unfortunately we have to pay 25% of our claim, you may not be aware that throughout this process, BP was running a pattern for the last eight or nine months in claims of appealing almost every claim to slow down a process. So to say that they were just so free and, and, and uh, so open with their willingness to pay is not true. They were appealing, and if you read uh, what they wrote in their appeal, I could, I, could probably, I could probably recite it verbatim because they wrote the same thing on every appeal. Every appeal that they took had the same wording. It became a joke within the law firm that represents me because they would show me one appeal after another, after another, after another with the same wording. Malcolm, we can see his point and we can see that the predicament that Nat is in. But BP is always going to look churlish in this situation. Uh, and now they just look churlish and now it's kind of looking like a big bad oil company again. Uh, I'm afraid so, because uh, what they had to do at the time was to sack the chief executive. Uh, then they had to uh, appoint Bob Dudley, who was because he was American and was from the South and so on. They thought that that might help. The point is that they never had any idea of how much th this would cost. I mean, if you take the, um, the EPA ban, 
which is the sort of press in the press at the moment because the British government are getting behind them and uh, and the API and the US Chamber of Commerce and so on. Uh, that's understandable, but but they never thought at that time that they would suddenly find that they wouldn't be able to get any contracts from the federal agencies. Now, the one that's highlighted most of all is the fuel for the US forces, which is a two billion dollar contract, but it it's actually not very uh, it's, it's not very profitable for them. What is more worrying is that we came back to the the Gulf of Mexico earlier on, which is such a key area for BP worldwide, is that if they suddenly started not being able to take contracts in the Gulf of Mexico, I mean, this really would be curtains. I mean, I I make no meal of the fact that when I talked about $100 billion, which uh, Paul picked up on, what I was talking about then was, you know, 50-odd billion of fines and costs and 50-odd billion which they've lost in market cap. It was only six months ago when they were fighting one of these cases. BP said they were worried about having to not pay any dividends. They're worried about employment in the in the US and the UK because they employ a lot of people in the US and in the UK. Uh, the, what they were mostly worried about was that uh, the situation was that they were continuing to have to sell assets to pay off all these fines, and the BP is going to getting a smaller and smaller company as as every day went on. You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. Joining me in the studio is Paul Stock, an independent oil consultant and solicitor, Richard North, a media fellow of the free market think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, Malcolm Graham Woods, an oil and gas consultant, and Nat Krasnoff, co-owner of the business Digital Designers. Richard, do you think that the British government is right to get behind BP? Well, it, it strikes me that the government's doing the right thing, but then I always thought that the anti-British feeling, if you like, that lurked behind the anti-BP feeling. I always thought that was a a silly thing for him to do, granted that BP was in large part an American company, an important part an American company. And also that I think a modern government should be saying to itself, actually, when big firms go wrong, quite often we should be far more worried, or at least as worried about whether our regulation was poor as about the quality of the oil company. I mean, one of the things I have banged on about for 10 or 20 years is that our regulators are government-sponsored and they are all over the firms until the firm is in trouble. The very firm that they've been regulating, it's it, the, the firm's mistakes are suddenly just the firm's, as though the regulator had not been watching them and signing them off. In other words, let's say you go to the Macondo thing, you say to yourself, well, what class of regulator was it that didn't know that this thing had not got a very good chain of command? I like it when politicians stand by firms much more than I like it when they dish them. And in particular, I don't like seeing patriotic cards being played mm. um, in in that way. So, so yes. And after all, if, if BP is good enough to drill oil for oil in the very area it once so badly polluted, and it is because it's got contracts there, then surely it's good enough to sell oil to the American military. I mean, at that level, the EPA's going against BP looked bullying and irrational and uh, grandstanding. Has has Deepwater Horizon transformed the oil business, do you think, Paul? Um, I think what it's done is it's made all oil companies look very carefully, carefully at their operational procedures. And um, over the past 25 years, oil companies have progressively outsourced activities and operations involving third-party contractors. And I think the, m- many of the problems with the um, Macondo well may relate to the use of third-party contractors, so w- whom BP did not um, supervise correctly. So I think from that point of view, yes, it's made people very conscious of the need to supervise contractors. I think it's also made people realise that you're better off spending money at the start of an operation protecting against a spill than cleaning up afterwards. And I think it's generally made people uh, in government and in society at large and in the companies much more aware of environmental issues. And what about those environmental issues and the infrastructural issues, Malcolm, more fundamentally? I mean, is the BP field the Tiber, which um, is even deeper. It holds 20 times as much oil as Macondo. It's 35,000 feet below the sea floor. It's, um, it's not stopping BP from, from, from pushing technology and, and perhaps taking more risks. I'm wondering if, if, if we are safer, if the oil industry is safer now. Well, it's definitely safer. I mean, the point of the Gulf of Mexico, you said 35,000 feet. I mean, that's below the ground, let alone in the water, the depth of water they're drilling in and the uh, and the, um, the amazing 
um, leaps in technology in the last few years uh, have allowed that to happen. You just have to think about the, uh, where people are drilling and how deep and, and how far they have to get the oil up. The, the most important thing is the role of the operator in all this because you know, the key thing here, is, as, as Paul pointed out, was that uh, you subcontract so much work. And in this case, they subcontracted Halliburton and they subcontracted Cameron, who did the blowout preventer. But the point is, where BP have lost out is that they said to Halliburton, you know, you go do this. Halliburton presented them with, this is what we're going to do. BP signed it. Now, once you're the operator, they can say that Halliburton did it wrong and the mud was wrong, whatever happened. If they go back to the ticket and it says, you signed off that we should have this much uh, cement or, or mud or whatever it should be, that's, that's down to the operator. So the role of the operator is absolutely critical. Uh, technology is moving on very fast. And, you know, you, you're finding, uh, you know, we get a whole new debate about fracking and so on, but that's the way that the operations are done. But deep down in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there is a huge amount of crude oil. Don't forget, the Americans drive 50 billion miles every month. I think one of the fascinating things that's changed in, in recent years is uh, the cultural change, that, that the impact of this spill it has really hardly dented the British media, the British national psyche, if you like. I mean, Exxon Valdez uh, fed uh, quite a strong environmental feeling right across the Western world. And, and yet this recent spill, tens of times worse, I think it is, produced very little, I would have thought, kind of impact of that kind here. And, and we see a great British institution like BP taking a clobbering. But uh, it seems to me that we're becoming curiously much more relaxed about things, much more prone, much less prone to kind of nightmaring things. The point about this in BP is that we haven't mentioned is the loss of life. Yes, uh, yes. And uh, the point is that course, 11 yeah. people died on this, uh, on this rig. And coming into this process, BP was still in deep trouble in the United States because they had an explosion at the Texas City refinery, mm. and that had killed a lot of people as well. Mm. Uh, and so BP were coming to this reputationally badly off, and I don't think we should forget about the fact that we're not just talking about of course. billions of dollars, but also not only the, the lives lost on the condo, but the fact that BP had a bad reputation on that front beforehand. Ned, can I just quickly ask you, what would constitute closure for you? We're in no man's land now, Brendan, because it's out of our hands. Other people, as usual, get to make decisions affecting our lives. Where we go, we wait. We waited three and a half years. And at the bottom of, at the, at the base of everything we're talking about, whether it's stockholders and BP that are affected, whether it's, or whether it's people like ourselves, uh, it still gets down to the human element. And we're never going to be able to replace the three years that we couldn't grow because of the losses that we sustained. And, and that, that's a terrible thing. That's a terrible thing to experience. I wish I could wave a magic wand, but I can't. I'm at the mercy of the courts right now. All we can do is hope we get paid. And as I said earlier, in our case, we're willing to accept one-third of what we know we lost. That was Nat Krasnov, co-owner of the Business Digital Designers. Joining me in the studio was Paul Stock, an independent oil consultant and solicitor, Richard North, media fellow of the free market think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, and Malcolm Graham Woods, who was an oil and gas consultant and founder of Hydrocarbon Capital. Thank you very much for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London.